But in DC, they don't they don't tell you why we have a lease on bridges. All they do is tell you to try to figure out if they're balanced or unbalanced. That's about all our mm -hmm. bridges. But normally we just don't use them. So normally we make uh, use these where we have resistors that do a lot of change their resistance with what they measure, and then we have to establish a reference. And what's nice about them is you can you can make them develop a plus or a minus, right, depending on the ratio of the, of the two sides. So uh, temperature sensors are very popular. Pressure sensors, you know, we can have a vacuum or we can have a pressure, right? Um, so we can we can establish what zero if we can establish what zero pressure is, then what can we do? Or we could have a we could have a standard. Uh, so instead of me setting it to zero, I might have a I might have a calibrated pressure gauge, and I put it on there, and it measures 100 psi. Then I can balance my then I can ha and I got that across my other sensor. Then I can adjust the other one until it measures one. 100 psi. So we don't necessarily have to have to set it to zero. We can set it to a, another standard. Uh, it's just like uh, when we calibrated scales, we couldn't set it to zero because you had the weight of the weight bridge out there. You didn't know you didn't know what it did, and uh, you couldn't set zero again. Uh, we, we couldn't really set a zero with our Wheatstone bridge because the weight of the weight bridge constantly changed. Uh, they brought a scale out at the uh, electro scale out at U.S. Steel, and uh, we installed it, and it, w it worked fine. But after a while, it was showing a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, because what would happen? Big old trucks would pull up there, and they'd drop stuff out on the scale. And once we said this was zero, it thought by George it was always what zero, and that was the weight rule. So most of your scales have what we call an auto zero function on them. Which means every once in a while, if, if there's not motion on the scale, which means something's pulling on there, uh, it would automatically zero a certain amount of weight out all the time. And they bought that electric scale without an auto zero circuit. So I designed, I don't know if it's still on that, uh, the, they call it the lime scale. It was the scale out in front of where the cue box was. Where all the lime, and they call it the lime scale because it was predominantly the big old lime scale things that come in there. And weigh their weigh, uh, they'd weigh coming in, and then uh, they'd weigh coming out, and they would know how much slime they actually dropped out. And, uh, and they bought that they bought that scale without an auto zero, on it. so I designed an auto zero and put it in there. And if it's still out, if that electric scale is still out there. It's got Rich's circuit in it. So what we're going to look at first is we're going to look at position standards. So what's the difference between a proximity sensor and a position sensor? Proximity tells you when it comes in the area. Well, at not, yeah, a very short zone. Is, uh, so a proximity sensor tells us when it's at a spot. A position sensor is going to tell us within a range, right? You understand? So a position sensor would more likely be a zone. Proximity means next to. Yeah. So the ones we're going to look at is position sensors. So these guys are going to sense the position of something as long as it's within a range. You can't say it's infinite, right? You understand? It's just like our eyes can sense position, but as long as it's within our range. It was, it was a, a thing about strange things on NASA. They were talking about some people that looked just like a missile. It was out at the uh, at the ocean, and it looked just like a missile had been launched. And what they could see is the contrast, and they, it looked just like a missile. But when they finally figured out it was an airplane, and it was on the ocean, so they could they were seeing the curvature of the of the. So the plane, you know, it's coming up, it's actually doing this. And its contrail looks like it was a missile. Yeah, yeah when they actually, you know, when they finally calibrated the speed, they knew it wasn't a missile because when they when they looked how how far it went, they realized it was going way too slow to be a missile. And they finally figured out it was a it was an airplane, but they were looking at it at the cur the curvature of the earth. That's pretty good. 
So sensors, we'll call them transducers, but technically a sensor is a transducer, but a transducer does not have to be a sensor. Y'all understand the difference right now, right? So what does a transducer do? Take from one form over to another form, right? You understand? And then a transducer, a sensor is going to take a physical stimuli and convert it into an electrical form. And transfer functions, we okay on that. Transfer functions are really, really neat. Are we okay? So this is the one uh, that, the list that was up there before. I think uh, there might be something, but we're going to talk about the business issues, so that's the one that we're In the first position sensor, we'll look at something you're already familiar with. The ones we're going to look at is the tensiometer. And we're going to look at optical rolling and codes. We're going to look at linear optical and codes. And then we're going to uh, look at linear variable differential transformers, or LVDT. And then in this lecture, and then uh, in later lectures, we'll look at photoelectric and sulfonic. These were all these two cents positions. So you got back in in uh, in BC, everybody y'all played with tensiometers in BC, right? Problem with BC, it's a it's an eight week term, and we're throwing all this stuff out with you, and there's just a little section on that. And so what's the difference between a potentiometer and a rheostat? One deals with current, one deals with voltage. Which one's which? A potentiometer deals with voltage. We use a potentiometer to control the voltage, and we use a rheostat to control a current. And you don't see many rheostats anymore. You don't see them. We can buy a potentiometer to do both. Well, potentiometers can do both, just depending on how we want. So what what we're going to do with a potentiometer is uh, what what did the potentiometer do for you? Some of y'all did y'all's labs, y'all remember? That was real easy. Uh, one of the things y'all did was measure it with an ohm meter. I think it's one of the things y'all did. But uh, normally what we do when we set these things up with a circuit. So this is a symbol of a potentiometer. Okay, we call this the wiper. And then we have where we apply power. Across here. And they're numbered one, two, three, so we give them numbers. And so what would happen if uh, if I was to come up here and put plus 10 volts over here and come over here and put uh, my common or my negative voltage down here, well, let's call it common. What do you do when you, so what are you doing? You're turning that wiper. You're setting a position on that wiper. Now you're doing it with your, you're doing it with your hand. But you got to understand, I can attach that little knob coming out of that pedantiometer. I can attach, I can attach it to other things, right? Anything that rotates would have the ability to turn that knob on that tensiometer. But what you're doing is that when you turn that knob, you're changing the position of the wiper, and you're changing you're changing the position of the wiper. And so the position of the wiper, if it's a rotary, if it's a rotary potentiometer, and that's all y'all have seen. We have two categories of potentiometers. Actually, we have more. Uh, we have, uh, let me go to the next one. We have an audio taper potentiometer. We're not going to use these as a position sensor because they vary in their, they, they're, they're non-linear. Uh, they vary the amount of resistance they have depending on the human ear. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have to use a linear taper pod, and that's very important because when you go out and buy these things, that's going to be specified as an audio taper or a linear taper. And what do we mean by linear? It's perfectly linear. What does that mean? Straight line. Straight line. So that means over here, uh, over here I might have votes. Over here I might have degrees. So we have, if it's a rotary pot, rotary pots are labeled in degrees, right? You understand? A linear pot would be in units of measure, like centimeters or millimeters or inches. 
But what we mean is, is if I have, if this is, uh, if this is ohms, and then this is degrees, then depending on how the pot's set up, depending on where, where we, or where, which one we use in one and two. So that's what varies. Which, which one do you use for the positive? Do you use one or do you use three? It don't make any difference. All you're doing is changing the angle of the slope, right? You understand? So one angle, I might have it like this. The other one would run like this. And this right here might be 350 degrees. Now what determines the angle of the slope? Which one you hook up to positive and which one you hook up to negative? And I never can keep up with it. We'd have to look at it. So if you if you use one and hooked it to the positive, it might generate a slope like this. If you hook three to positive, it might generate a slope like that. But what is it? It's a linear output, right? You understand that. So if it's a if it's a 10k pot, which is what we're going to use, that means if I set it to zero k, it would be at zero degrees. If I set it at it, uh, if we set these things off, so let's just split this in half. And we'll get close to it. Uh, what? You know, 175. Then that means that guy right there would measure what? 5K on one side, right? And 5K on the other. So what you're doing with a pot, you got three options. You got one where you can make it act like this. So it means if I measure across this, what's it going to measure? It's going to measure the applied voltage, right? You understand. You got another way you can set it like that. It means it's going to act like a watt. So what would happen if I measure across that? What would I measure? What would you measure across a straight piece of wire? Zero. Or I can make it do this. And anywhere between, so here, if I set my pot, if I set my pot up here, So one, two, three. But what I'm saying is that I can make three up here just as good as I make what? One. And down here, this would be two, and this would be three. And I don't know. I'd have to look and see which one. So let's say this is 10 volts. Well, if I come up here and I set my wiper, so it's all the way at the top, and then I measure with my voltmeter, then what's it going to measure? It's going to measure 10 volts. You know, understand that? That makes sense. If I come up here and I move my wiper all the way to the bottom, then what's it going to measure? It's going to measure zero. Though. Now, if I set it somewhere in the center, it's going to be acting like a dual resistor voltage divider. With this right here being what? This right here is two. So if I make this one, and I make if I make this uh, was 10k. So let's I, let's say I make this eight. Then this down here is going to be what? Two. It's 10k. So the total of those resistors are always going to be what? 10k. You understand? That's what a 10k pot is. It don't tell you where you're sitting. In. It tells you if I take a 10k pot. And I measure across one and three, it's going to measure about 10K, depending on the resolution or the accuracy of the point. Everybody understand that? If I measure between the wiper, if this right here is three and this right here is two, if I measure between the wiper and two, and I'm sorry, this is one, I would measure 2K. If I measure between the wiper and three, it would measure 8K. If the if the pot was a perfect 10k pot, y'all understand that. So if that's 2k and that's 8k, this is going to drop two tenths of the guy. This is going to drop eight tenths. Now I'm not rounding. That'll drop eight tenths. The biggest resistor is going to drop the biggest voltage, right? You understand? Now what we're doing is we're using a world famous formula called the voltage divider formula. Y'all remember that? So what, what's the voltage divider formula? 
the voltage divider formula is V V across any resistor. Of course, we'll call so let's call this just for namesake R1 and R2. Since this is common, we're taking it across R2. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to calculate the voltage across R2. But how would we do that? Well, it's going to be the value of R2 divided by total resistance. What's nice about a pot is RT is always going to be equal to the size of the pot, right? You understand? So if this is a 10K pot, it's always going to be 10K. Now, this is what we're looking at right here. We're looking at that ratio. And then I can take that. And then I can multiply that by the source resistor, and that would tell me the voltage across R2. But what we're looking at, and notice right off the bat, I said this was, I'm, so knowing the voltage of the formula, I know this would be what? 8 tenths. This would be what? 2 fifths. And this would be 2 fifths, right? And then, or this is going to drop 1 fifth of the voltage. This guy here is going to drop 1 -fifth. Yeah, y'all understand that. Now that has nothing to do with the applied voltage. Once, and that's what's nice about the voltage divider formula. Is back in DC, what you would probably do if I gave you a series circuit and you calculated the voltage drops. If I said, okay, let's raise the voltage from 10 volts to 20 volts, what would you do? You'd recalculate the current. You'd go back and multiply that through. But once you've established the ratio of a resistor, those resistors will drop the ratio no matter what the voltage. But if I come over here and make this a 3K, then what's this guy up here going to have to be now? This is going to be a 7K. This guy's going to drop 3 tenths. This guy right here is going to drop 7 tenths. I mean, that's what's so nice about pots, because you can you can figure the ratio no matter where you set it at, right? But you got to understand, I'm using I'm using 3K. What could it actually be if it's a pot? I could have... I could have uh, 3.33333k, right? You understand that? And the other one would be whatever the whatever was left over there. So what we're doing is we're varying our voltage divider. If we vary our voltage divider, then we're going to vary our output voltage. So now I'm taking a position that is in degrees, and I'm going to convert it into a voltage that represents that. Everybody understand that? So what would be my transfer function? Well, with pots, it's real easy. You take the maximum, you take the voltage you're going to apply to the pot. So we're going to output volts. You divide it by this, the size of the pot, and this gives you the transfer function. So what would be my transfer function? Well, let's don't do it that way. So let's say it was a 350 degree pot. Because we're not trying to go from we're not trying to go to ohms, we're trying to go what? So first of all, we need to know the maximum span of the pot. Most rotary pots, just just a a, a single turn rotary pot, you can't you can't get 10k. I'm sorry, you can't get 360 degrees out of the pot. Why is that? Because here's the internal work for most pots. We have a resistive element, here's a carbon. You gotta bring out two somehow. So you gotta have a space between one and three, so you'll never get 360 degrees. So usually 350 degrees is what you would get out of one of those pots. So if you took that thing and turned it, it'd never, it, it'd stop over here somewhere and it'd stop over here somewhere, it would never go 360 degrees if it's what we call a single turn pot. They call it a single turn pot, but it's not going to be what? Single turn. So if I can measure those degrees, then what I could do now is I could come up and I can figure out my transfer function. So we were doing that wrong because my output is not going to be, my input is not, if it's, if it's a position sensor, my input's not going to be K. My input's going to be degrees, right? You understand? My output's going to be volts. My input's going to be degrees. So my transfer function would be equal to 10 divided by 350. So what would my transfer function be? Now this is volts, this is degrees. 
the votes are not going to cancel out and the degrees are not going to cancel out, right? You understand? So my answer is going to be votes per degree. And that's why we say it. So we'll use this term, we'll use this right here to represent per. So my answer should actually be this. Both per degree. All right, let's just put D instead of the little third. So what would be my transfer function? Never vote for you. So now I can say, okay, what would the output voltage be for 30 degrees? Well, then my output voltage would be. How'd you do that? Well, you just took what? You put 30, which is our degrees, we multiply that times our transfer function. And it would give you what the vote would be. So what do we get without? What would you say, Jerry? I put 85 votes. <laughs> Yeah, let's yeah, yeah, one or two decimal points is okay. So 87, uh, 85.7.1 would probably be more correct because these guys are pretty accurate. Depending on what we call a linearity error, it's, it's almost impossible to get a pot to be a perfect one of these. I use the pots vary in kind of like an S an S term, but it's pretty they're pretty good and they're very reliable, but they're not gonna be y'all understand it's not gonna be perfect. I'm still using that answer, but I got when I do the formula, I came out and I used one that point five to a uh so I I So this is our transfer function. This is our vote per degree. That's our vote per degree. Period. Vote per degree. So now what we would do is we would take our degrees and multiply it by this number. Not any other number. We'd multiply it by this number. So I don't know. When we did that number, you know, you know what I'm saying? It actually went. All right, we cut it off at 8.5. It actually kept going. I don't know what you mean. Like when you do the transfer function. Oh yeah, well, that's, what, that's what I said. We would probably round it to two decimal points. Oh, oh. So I understand what you're saying. So, so, so his number, he used the answer times other, and I used that number. So we were all like. Okay, yeah. So so it's just not that it's not that critical. Usually on this, uh, it depends where we, how critical that we need to be, because the pot itself is going to have a linearity error. And there's, it's almost impossible to have a potentiometer that has a perfect, that develops a perfect straight line on its resistance, and they call it the linearity error. It would be like so many tenths of an ohm or something like that. But that would be your maximum error. So it's, 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 it's pretty complicated for, and we see this all the time. So when we say a hundred ohm resistor, what's the odds of it being exactly a hundred ohm? Exactly. Now your measure, your meter might measure at a hundred ohms, but then we've got meters that are extremely accurate when I get into these standards. So when they calibrate your meter, they're going to calibrate that meter according to a standard. And that standard is going to be a heck of a lot more accurate than what you're measuring, right? You understand that? Uh, so the, the best we have on meters are like we call four and a half digit meters. So if it's a 4,000 count meter, we call it a half a digit even though it's not true. Uh, it, it won't go, your most significant digit on no meter will, ne will ne ac never actually go from zero to 10. It, it's going to range on a digital meter. It's going to range depending on the resolution of the meter. We have three basic resolutions. We have 2,000 count meters, we have 4,000 count meters, and we have 6,000 count meters. 
So the 6,000 count digital meter is the most, has the best resolution. But still the most significant digit is still going to go from zero to five. And then it's going to go 5.999 if it's a four and a half digital meter. But if I'm going to calibrate that thing, then I'm going to put a precise voltage into it. I'm going to measure it with a, a, a standard and then I'll calibrate it to say 5 -0. But the problem is, is your meter still is not perfectly what linear. So, so just about anything that we have is not is not perfect. So potentiometers are not perfect. So one of the one of the specifications, if you actually got the true specifications on the on the pot, is one something called a linearity error. And this is how much it should vary, the maximum it should vary over an entire range. But you don't really know. You just know that would be your basic of your percent error. Application you need to do so the percentage does not need that. Yeah, I mean we're not trying to, you know, do some of the things that would require that accuracy in the industry. Do something, use something else besides the percentage. We use I mean, every one of them is going to have a resolution too. Uh, most of the position sensors that we have has a resolution, so we, we cannot deal with infinity. Everybody understand that. Um, so we don't we we talk about infinity all the time, but nobody really understands it. Because you know, people say insulators have infinite resistance and that's false. We have we have we have instruments that can measure the resistance of an insulator. We call them mega mega me me But we don't understand infinity. So if I've got my own meter up in the air, there is a resistance between my two wires, right? My two conductors. Now our meters are going to measure, most of our meters now don't measure, they measure, they don't measure infinity, they just show what? Overload, which means it's what? It's, it's beyond the range of the meter. If our air had infinite resistance, we wouldn't have to worry about lightning. <laughs> Uh, so everybody, okay, so what we do on these things, and, and so these are what we call rotary potentiometers. We basically have two types. Well, this would be what we call a rotary pot. And then, of course, we have linear pots. So of the two uh, positions, so we're over on the manufacturing line, uh, we have a position sensor. We have potentiometer position sensors on two, both lines, and they're both these guys here. Now we have different position sensors, right? You understand that. But the, we have two, both lines have a potentiometer position sensor. And both of them use the linear pot. Now these guys, the transfer function is going to be so many both per inch or something like that, right? Over here we use inches or whatever. And that would be the way we calculate transfer function. Uh, we also have the multi turn pot. We have 10 turn pots, we have 20 turn pots. Uh, I didn't bring any of these over here. But we do have pots that have the ability to measure more than 350 degrees. So if you had a 10 turn pot, then that would be 10 turns, so that'd be 360 times 10, right? You understand? It should be 3,000. So when we calculate our transfer function, we use 3,600 degrees on the ball. So those pots would have a lot higher resolution, right? You understand that? Um, these multi-turn pots. I and mean, we do have some of them. Uh, these are pretty neat because these actually take a, a, a so the screw what you're doing is you're turning the screw and you have a little carriage on here that's feeding the screw and you turn the screw, it slides up and down to reduce the velocity. So first of all, you need to understand what type of pots you're using, right? You understand so it depends on whether you're using a units of measure or if you're using degrees. Rotary pots, you're going to use what? Degrees. Linear pots, you'll use unit of measure. Are we okay? So this is a real neat animation that I got off the internet. Let me see. There's another one. I don't know if that's on here or not. I got another one. Which is better? Uh, 
to actually show the light we're moving by the position. Now, what we see possible right now is that we, I've got, I have to go find it, but I have a pot that I take to the shaft of a motor. And then I come over here and I take one pot and I turn it and the motor moves with, with my potentiometer over here. What you doing? I'll try to find that and see if I still got it. Uh, so this is the example of attaching a rotary pot to a to a or actual motor. So we say a motor. What's the difference between a motor and a, a rotary actuator? A lot of people think it's motor just rotate. That's that you know. Usually when we say a motor, we mean a an actual a rotary actuator that can turn that has no stroke. Y'all know what a stroke on an actuator is? What is? Kim's back there. Again. So what's the stroke of an actuator? The distance that it can move. So rotary actuators are usually rated in degrees. Linear actuators are rated in units. Like a linear actuator might have a six inch stroke. That means it could go all the way from zero out to what? Six inches. Or what we determine to, right? there are very few linear actuators that actually pull their uh, rod completely. In. A motor has no, uh, a true, a motor ha is an, a rotor actuator that has no stroke. Which means what? It can spin. It's just so sorry. It can just spin. But sometimes we have to limit the stroke. So, uh, like anybody have electric door locks on their, on their motor? I mean, on their car? And what, what do they use as an actuator? Can't use the solenoid. Solenoid only generates force in one direction. Uh, I would, if I, I could lock it, but I'd never be able to do what? Unlock. So what, what do we use uh, to, to lock and unlock our door? Use a motor. It's a motor. So if it was a solenoid, I'd have to leave it energized all the time to keep it locked, right? <laughs> and then when I release it, we could do it with a solenoid, but that's not what we do. So it's a motor on there. Uh, so a motor, we say it has an unlimited stroke, but somehow inside that car door, we gotta, we gotta limit that stroke, right? You understand? We gotta make that thing, the motor turn long enough to do what? Unlock it and then stop because we don't like stalling electric motors because they'll burn up on you. And then when you unlock the door, you got to have something that does what? Limits the stroke both ways. So here we got an example of a rotary pod, and a rotary pod is going to run out of, of the problem with a rotary pod is, is that we got one of two options. We're going to have a limited stroke on the rotary pod, or the rotary pod is just going to start, it's just going to, if it spins, it's just going to repeat itself, right? You understand? For most pots, I've never seen a pot that just sits there and spins. Uh, so odds are we're going to have to limit the stroke on this. So what we're doing here is we're going to rotate this motor. Somehow we're going to rotate this motor um, from what? What they reference is what? Zero degrees to two feet. And then what I'm going to do, and we got, there's a better way of doing this. Because this will, this will oscillate a lot. And, and this one we won't get into uh, PID control. But what I could do is uh, this famous circuit that we call a comparator, right, you understand, is a comparator. I could come over here and then I could use a pod over here to set a voltage. And then I could bring the pod out here. I could bring it up into the other input. And then this right here would be the guy that's actually running. This would be the switch that's actually running the motor. And I've got one of these set up, guys. It's real neat. So what I can do is I can come over here on this pod. This pod, this is what I'm controlling. And I can turn it as I turn it the motor. And we have to do something different out of it. We need to be able to determine direction. 
So I've got it set up what determines the direction. But what I can actually do, if I have it in the center, if I turn it one way, the motor will turn like clockwise. If I move it the other way, the motor will turn nine, nine, nine. Huh? It is, but uh, people think that motors just run, but that we can control them. Like a perfect example is we can limit the stroke on something that has no limit, but we do it electronically, right? Or electrically. So that's what they do on your car door. So if you ever took that thing apart, you'd see a motor on there. And they limit the stroke on the motor. But it allows us to create a lot of torque in one direction and then turn it off, right? You under and then we can do what? Yeah, electric motors don't like to be stalled. They, they, they'll burn up. By the way, uh, this is what we call, uh, we call this, this has got two names. This is called closed loop. So what we do with closed loop is we tell our actuators to do something, and then we have some type of sensor that indicates if the actuator did what I told it to do. These are called closed loop systems. And you run into if you got a cruise control on your car, you got a closed loop system. If you're cruising along at 60 miles an hour, you engage that sucker. There's got to be a sensor out there that's saying you're going this fast, and then you're comparing it to an, a, what we call a set point, which would be how fast you want it to go, and you're getting you get a feedback. So we call this we get we we call this right here feedback. Oops, let's go there. By uh, back, this is also called a servo system. By the way. So a servo system is a system that provides feedback. And these are also called closed loop systems. Y'all understand how I got that name? A closed loop system is we tell our actuator what to do, and then we do what? We have something, we have some type of sensor out there that says, okay, you're doing what I told you to do. And a, a perfect example, of course, like I told y'all, would be speed control in your car. So there's a sensor out there that senses the speed, right? You understand that? And then when you engage it, you're setting a set point. This is a set point. So what's the set point? I need to put that in the in the glossary. What's the set point on a closed loop system? That's what you establish what you want it to do, right? You understand? And then the feedback is giving you what the actuator is actually doing, right? You know what I'm oh, by the way, these are usually these these uh, controls uh, are usually represented in a symbol like this. If you've ever seen that symbol. <laughs> And that's what it represents. It represents the comparators in the comparator circuit. So you'd have what on one end. You'd have your set point on one. Then you'd have what? Your feedback on here. And then you'd have the output of the summing junction. If you ever see that symbol, that's usually what they draw because a lot of people don't understand the left bottom. They draw that to represent that. A summing amplifier it comes in and just uh, so that here they calculated the uh, they're using 10 volts they've calculated the transfer function just like we did before so what do you do if you know your voltage at your maximum that's the easiest thing to do you take your maximum voltage at your maximum degree and that's where you get your transfer and then once you've done that, now we can do it. Now when I get a voltage off this thing, it's going to indicate a what? Degree. And what we do in PLCs, by the way, is uh, we use, uh, they, they give us a box. Have y'all had, up, is everybody here at PLC? Or intro to PLC? One of the boxes that, uh, that the PLC gives us on an analog input, it gives us a scale. So that's what we're doing. We're setting the transfer function. We're saying 10 volts equals this. And that gives our PLC uh, uh, an accurate measure of what it uh, what it is doing. So a scaling a scaling of instruction on a PLC would be ones that we'd use to actually set the the transfer function. What would be our transfer function here? Uh, a pod is supplied a well we're about to calculate that, but a pod is supplied with ten volts and sets at eighty two degrees. 
the range of the single turn part is 350 degrees, calculate the output. So what would the output be at 82 degrees? out. We're putting degrees in, right? You understand. So it's going to be 10 over 350. We've already calculated that. What's that? 28 point? Yeah, 28.5. Is that okay? Is that what we use? Okay. And then we multiply that times the actual setting of the pot. And this would tell us what voltage we should expect out. What's that? 2.35 is what I came up with. Of course, I didn't round it out. But this is what I came up with. Also, the transfer cost. Can you try? Now, now I need to know. Now you need to let me know if I measure a voltage. Because this is we're not dealing with this. We're dealing with okay. If if I measure this voltage, what degree is my pot set to? Does that make sense? Let's see if I got that one. Let's do that. So let's say I measure 8.2. What does that mean? So this is what I'm measuring on the output of my pot. Yeah, well, so let's just take our, our formula. So transfer function is equal to, we can use this thing that we learned how to do back in DC, right? Out over N. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to calculate N, right? You understand? So I'm going to rearrange this. So what would N be equal to? It's going to be equal to out over the what? Over the transfer function. So anytime you've got a three expression formula, you can put it inside this triangle or this wheel or whatever you call it, this circle, and you can you can transpose that equation really, really fast. They don't teach you that in algebra. What do y'all learn in algebra how to transpose equations? You divide both sides, you multiply both sides, you come back there and yeah, you have to do the same thing this way. Here, all we have to do is just, we got a three term equation, just put it inside this little triangle, the way you want to call it. So, what would be, uh, what would be my degree, guys? So, if we took uh, 8.2 volts, divided it by uh, 28.6 millivolts, then that would tell us what an angle our pot would say. 287 degrees. So whatever this guy here is measuring, this is where we need to look at. We, we use a transfer function to set up our equipment, but once we get our transfer function, we need to figure out, okay, now, if I get this voltage out of this thing, what does that mean? Well, that means the pod is at that, is at that distance. Or we could multi, we could, we could use multiple transfer functions, right? So we could have what we call a rack and pinion. So what's a rack and pinion? A rack of pinion is a device that takes a linear motion and converts it into a rotary motion or vice, or vice versa. So the linear one is what we call the rack, and then the rotary, the guy that rotates, we call it the pinion. But this right here could be my what? What could be connected to the pinion? Well, this could be my what? This could be my pot. So what I'm doing with this is I'm taking a linear motion and converting it into a what? A rotary motion. Everybody understand that? So here, we take a little more concentration. For one thing, I would need to know the length of the rack. And my, the length of the rack, rack is not going to be in what? Degrees. So what we would, we'd have two transfer functions. Uh, transfer functions. Would have degree, would have length to degrees, and then we'd have degrees to volts, right? You understand? Everybody understand that? Yes or no? So, how, what length do you want to make this? Okay. 
which is a rut. So six inches. So if we call this zero over here, this over here would be six inches. So odds are when we figure our transfer function, we need to come over here and say six inches. Right, you understand? So that's going to be what? This is going to be our input. What's our output going to be? Not yet. Because I'm going from inches to degrees. So this would be how many degrees our pot would be at six inches. So let's say it's 350 degrees. So out over in, 350 degrees, 6 inches. So what's my transfer function going to be? Fifty-eight point three degrees per inch. Okay. Yeah, I got per. Let's put D up there instead. Of. So any this the anytime we we use this division symbol to represent what per. Okay, so what is this going to do us now? No, it's not. Yeah, but then we got to come up and get this to, to, you're exactly right. So now I can say if I move five inches, it's going to move my pot 360 degrees. <coughs> but I'm not getting degrees out of my pot when I'm getting both. I'm getting both. So what would we have to do now? So let's use the same thing that we did a while ago. Uh, let's say we're going to apply 10 shut folks to our pot. So it's going to be 28.6 millivolts per degree. Okay. So what would we get out of our pot at... So what would we get out of our pot? And we can combine these guys, and we'll, we would come up here. But let's say, what would we get out of our pot at three inches? And we know what we should expect. But let's see if it works. So we should get we should get pretty close to five volts, right? Everybody okay? Should be half, and that's why we're shooting with this to see if we're going to do it right. So what we're doing is we're punching in something that we know what the answer should be. And if the answer comes up to be what it should be, then odds are we're doing our math correct. I watched the, uh, I watched the movie The Martian. You ever seen that movie? You ought to get that. It might be. On, I think it's. I think they got it on Netflix. But that's what he did. He gets stranded on Mars. Huh? Go potatoes. But that's the whole time. The math. If it works out on the math. The math. Is that where he's wandering around in the Well, he does one in rounds once he figures out what he's trying to do. But it's really good. Oh, it's got a lot of stuff that we do, like the ASCII code. Is that, which is the code that we teach in digital. He uses that code to transmit. So what do we got, guys? So what's the first thing y'all did? I did, I did, uh, multiple inches. Multiple inches. Yeah. 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 So you bypass, you bypass one section, which is good. We're going through the whole thing, and that's, and what you would find out is if we would set these, uh, if we were to set these things, uh, in a place, and I have to go back and look, you'd come up and get the, so what you would get is you'd get the overall transfer function of the system. So what you did is you went all directly to the output. 
when we start going through different things, uh, like different gear ratios and all that kind of stuff from our input over to our output, what you can literally do is is uh, take the math and reduce it down to an overall transfer function. I think that's one of those things. But going through here, uh, three inches would be what? And what we're doing, we're trying to calculate, we're trying to go back and check this math. Uh, so what would I do here? I take three times fifty-eight point zero. Right, one thing. What does that come up and get? And then we should be able to multiply it by zero, right? And it should come up and get point five. Point five. So that would be going through the whole the whole thing. So if we took this transfer function. And multiplied it by this transfer function. So if I took all my transfer functions in a system and just multiplied it together, then I would come up for then I would come up with a transfer function for the system, right? Understand? Which is what Anthony did to start off with, but that's what I was trying to show you how to do. Right? So if I if I take voltage and it runs a motor and the motor turns gears and the gears turns this and this turns that. And what I could do is I could figure it instead of trying to do the whole thing, I could do the what? Each transfer function for each unit inside the system would multiply the transfer function together, and then I would come up with an overall transfer function for the system. Right? And that's what we're saying. Are we okay? Yes or no? That makes sense. Now there's the comparator. So this would be something like that. So we got a motor turning a pot. We got a motor turning a gear, turning a pot. Now gears, guys, what do we use gears for? What, what do we use gears for? We use gears for lots of things. Now we, we can use it to change to change ratios, uh, but a lot of people don't understand some of the laws of physics. Uh, like power in equals power out, right? You know what I'm saying? So we don't have anything that creates power. Uh, that gets more, I can't say that. We, we, we take energy, we can't create energy. What can we do with energy? We can change its form, right? You understand? So in electronics or electricity, we got to understand that uh, my output power and my input power are going to be what? Same. And people say, well, how do we get stereo amplifiers? Well, stereo amplifiers run off a power supply, right? You understand that? So we bring a little symbol in, a little, a small signal in, and then we use the power available from our power. We control the power available from our power supply. Now go out there and disconnect the power plug on your radio and see if you can hear, hear any music on it, right? You understand? So what we do with these gears is we do one of two things. We either, they either multiply torque or they multiply speed. So if we go from little to big, little to big, what type of multiplier would this be? I'm sorry, big to big. Did I say that backwards? Here we're going from big to little. What would that mean? That'd be a speed multiplier. So what would happen to the torque on the output? It go down. Yeah, of course work is equal to torque times speed. So that means if if, if if that work coming in is equal to the work going out, if I increase the speed, the torque's going to go down. If I decrease the speed of the output, the torque is going up. Going up. So this would be a speed multiplier. So what we could do is we could calculate the transfer function of each one of these, then we could multiply the transfer function together and come up with an overall transfer function. So here our input is in one degrees, right? Then we're going through this, then we're going through that, right? We're not going to figure that out. I think we missed a break. Didn't we? Analog, uh, analog to digital converters, are we okay here? Most current controllers are digital devices. A lot of quantities that need to be measured are what? Analog 
So we have three types, and we're just going to look at this basis. And most of the time, guys, this is totally transparent to me. So what type of A to D converter does your multimeter have? So your multimeter, how many people have an analog meter? How many people have digital meters? Okay. Is your meter measuring analog? No, your meter, your meter is a digital meter, guys. So what's inside that meter? What? An analog to digital converter. What kind is it? Is it a flash converter? Is it a successive approximation or a zoom converter? I don't know if it's like that. It's probably is highly unlikely that it's a flash converter. Because a flash converter takes a lot of hardware. It's extremely fast, but it takes a lot of circuitry to get that. So it's either going to be a successive approximation or it's going to be an integrated. Integrating, by the way, this is doesn't need to mix it up. Integration, integration is a mathematics of intervals, which means we're dealing with slopes, right? Well, this is a flash converter. So, a flash converter, we have all these comparators, and then we set up a bridge, and all the all, all the weight of all the resistors are exactly the same, so they drop exactly the same. Way. So on our comparators, we bring one end to the end, we bring our unknown on the other end to it, and depending on how it is, we got the resistors in one. So the problem we have with flash converters, number one, is they don't give you a weighted number. So the first thing they would give you if they saw nothing, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, this is an eight bit flash converter. Okay, and then when it when it exceeded this one, so that would be the resolution, uh, then the output of the flash converter would go to this. If it exceeded the next one, the output of the flash converter would go to this. If the next one, it would be what? Let's see what I'm saying. Because what's going to happen is that when these break this thing up, when this is exceeded, this will always be a one. And then this will be a zero. And then the next one would do what? It go to one, and the next one go to one, and this would go to one, 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 this would go to one. Well, that's not the weight of the number. Everybody understand that? Everybody understand what I mean by weight? It's not a binary number. It's just a, it's a code representing it. So then we have, if we're going to get a binary number out of this, then we have to run it into a. Uh, Chip like a 74141. And we we'll know what that guy is right? <laughs> It's a 4-bit priority chip. In digital, you'll use this guy. But what this guy does, it takes the, this priority code and converts it over to a binary number. So it will take this and convert it over. But this is going to be instantaneous. And the only time we, only thing that we, we're concerned with is how long it takes to propagate to this right here. So the advantage of a flash converter, it's called a flash converter for a reason because it's what? Extremely fast. But if I wanted to add another another one, I couldn't do it with 174141. I'd have to use another one because all it does is take a, takes a priority on A from O B. But I'd have to add a whole other section. I'd have to come up here and add another resistor. I'd have to recalculate all my resistors, right that stuff out. And I'd have to do what? So I'd have to add, I'd have to add one of these circuits for every bit. I mean, if I was doing uh, uh, 10 bits, I would have to have what? 10 of these circuits. So they occupy a lot of space. They're instantaneous, but they occupy a lot of space. Almost instantaneous. And the resolution, of course, would be what we're putting up there on our reference. And then all the size of these resistors that all these Parallel A to D, using serial comparators, uh, being into the different reference nodes and starting. Uh, so we're talking about these comparators, right? Everybody okay on those things? There's a lot to those things, but they're really neat. So one of our input 
By the way, a lot of people get confused with these. They think this is minus. Uh, these guys right here, these are symbols. And what's a symbol? Something else, yeah. So we run into that this this cross symbol and this minus symbol. We run out. We run into all over the place. Uh, one of the places we use it, the predominantly is in DC power supply. Uh, we use it in uh, a type of communication we're looking in called uh, differential. And it don't mean plus or minus. It means one of them means inverted and one of them means non-inverted. Uh, that's exactly what this is: inverted or non-inverted. And so the minus would be inverted, and the answer would be not, the other side would be not inverted. So what we do is we, uh, when the minus exceeds the plus, or when the non, the inverted exceeds the non-inverted, the output would be zero. As soon as this non-inverted exceeds, the output will switch to a what? One. So what we do on these comparators is we bring a reference voltage here. And this is the way some of our, our digital sensors work. So the actual sensing element, so a temperature sensor is temperature. I mean, a pressure sensor is analog. Everybody understand that? Because pressure is what? It's analog. Um, uh, temperature is not analog. Temperature is not what? Temperature is not digital. Temperature is analog. But yet I can go over there on my, 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 uh, I can go over there on my on my thermostat, and I can go over there and I can set a temperature. So what you're doing is you're setting a what? You're setting what we call a threshold. So what you're doing is you're basically it's, it's a little different now because they're all different. Is you're changing the reference. That's all you're really doing. You're changing what we call the set point. And then when the temperature exceeds that that set point, if you got it set for air conditioning, it would do what? It would turn the air conditioner what? Oh, um, if it's set for the other one, it would do what? Uh, this building uses, it's, it's a really neat feature this guy uses. Uh, this guy actually has uh, two two uh, duct works. Uh, one of them is constantly running hot. The other one is constantly running what? cold. And then what we have is we have a vein down here. We have our vent. And then we have a vein down here that does what? It's hard to show, but it either moves it toward the cold or moves it toward the hot. So they run the boilers and the, and the air conditioners basically year round. So what I have the ability to do with this system is this this guy's analog guy. So I can literally do a uh, set the temperature. I don't have a dead band or hysteresis. You know. Well, this is basically what you're doing on your thermostat is you're setting a water. You're setting a set point. Then you got some type of temperature sensor. And that's the way basically what your air conditioner is. And most most of your new thermostats are totally digital, so they they convert it over, but you're still using an analog sensor. Your temperature is still what? Analog. Are we okay? So flash converters are very fast, need many parts, 256 comparators or for an 8-bit A to B. Uh, low resolution because it's basic, so you have, you're going to have, inside a flash control, uh, converter, you're going to have 8-bit. Uh, if you got 8-bit, that's 255 combinations. Right, you understand? And if you're doing something between those 255 combinations, somewhere it's going to switch. But it won't switch until it gets up to that other value, right? And so, so you got one, you got one volt coming in, it switches the first one. You got 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. It's still not going to switch because it's going to wait till it exceeds that next value before it switches. 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 2.0, then it does what? Then it switches. So well, this guy don't round them. This guy don't round. <laughs> right? It don't round up and it don't round down. It just maintains whatever it's got until it gets to the other. Uh, they're expensive because they take a lot of hard weld and consume a lot of power because you're constantly counting the power at that bridge. Right? We just, your voltage up. So 
So the only advantage of a flash converter is what? Uh, successive approximation is really different. Uh, what is successive approximation? Anybody know? So, uh, how can I explain this? So, what we do on successive approximation is when I'm comparing these things, uh, and let's say uh, this is 100 degrees, and this right here is zero degrees. Now what we're going to do, we got one option, is I can come up here and I can start my comparator. And I could take samples all the way up this line. And let's say it's 30 degrees. I know it's not in the center. Well here it would say it was 30 degrees. Now so what we do on this type of, of uh, converter, we would start, you can see the biggest problem here, we could start at zero, right, you understand? And then we could, and this is what they're going to do, and what they do on these guys is they start generating, your ramp, your reference voltage is going to be generated by a ramp generator. So what would happen is you'd start off on our reference, we would start off, we would start off with a ramp. And then soon as it match, soon as your unknown match, and this is going to take a lot less hardware, so soon as your input unmatched, then it would go true and you would reset your ramp and you would do what? You start over. But what happens is we're checking all these voltages all the way from here to right there. What successive approximation is, it's a method where you start in the center. So if my ramp voltage was, if my ramp voltage was 10 volts, instead of starting at zero and ramp it up, I'd start at 5 volts. Right, you understand? And then if, if it did match, what would I do? i go to 7.5 volts. And if it didn't match, right, you understand, then I would keep increasing it toward the other end. As soon as I exceeded it, then I would start dropping it down until I found it. So successive approximation, I think it's like in four four steps you'll find you'll find it within four within four votes of So successive approximation means you don't start at the front, you start at the wall, the middle. You see if it's greater than or less than. If it's less than, you'll half it. Now if it's greater than, you'll half it again. I mean, you'll half it again, right? You understand? What successive approximation is. So where do you start at? Start in the middle. Mm -hmm. Then depending on what your comparator gives you out, if it says, okay, your ramp is less than, then it would half the voltage, right? You understand? If it says, okay, it's more than, then it would double the voltage. So, so it's got a successive generator that, so the ramp is, is not starting as, it's not a ramp anymore, it's what? You understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? So what we would do is I'm bringing in a I'm bringing in a voltage. Let's say I'm bringing in three volts. Well, what we would do is I would come up here, and if my my ramp generator could measure up to five volts, I mean up to ten volts, I would start at five. So we put five volts right there. Right? You understand? And the output would switch negative. So this guy here has a negative and positive supply. So if the output switch is negative, I know that my ramp is what? Too big. Right? Then I would drop down to what? To I drop back to 2.5. Then this guy right here would switch positive. So now I know I'm a little what? I'm a little, I'm a little below it. And then we'd go half again, half again. So within, I think it was five steps you would be in on the, the so this is what a CIS approximation does. So instead of instead of ramping here, right, you understand, what does it do? It starts in the middle and then bounces back and forth until it finds it. Because it's speed, it's faster. It's not as fast as a flash converter, but this is the second type, this is the second fastest about it. Well, you know you don't have to start at zero. No, yeah, odds are if you're measuring something, the odds are it's not going to start at zero anyway. But so instead of starting at zero and ramping it up until you find it, we start in the center, right? You understand? And then if the output of my comparator switch is negative, I know I'm I know I'm below it. If the 
which which is positive I've known my brother. And then we bounce around in it until we find out. And uh, the advantage of these is that they're fast. But to you, it really don't mean anything, right? Because all you're doing is you're looking, you're taking the output of this guy, and uh, you're going to generate a count. So you generate a count uh, depending on this value right here, which is pretty neat. We'll talk about that in a minute. The most popular one, though, is a, I, I, I didn't learn it as a sigma delta. I learned it as a uh, as a uh, integrator. Uh, but this is where I got this. Uh, what they do on, on this guy is they use an integrator. Now, an integrator, uh, integration in mathematics is deals with slopes, the angle of the slope. If you ever had any calculus, you know, but basically what we start with these guys, and this is what just about every digital multimeter uses. I don't know what the PLCs use because it's transparent to us. I put an analog value in and it gives me a binary number out. That's all I know. Whether it uses a flash converter, which is highly unlikely, it's either going to be use a successive approximation or it's going to use a, 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 a integrator. So what they do here is they, maybe this is not it. No, this is what they're showing. What they do here is they come in and they generate, a, they put a reference voltage on there. And the reference voltage is usually a minus voltage. And what it does is it calls the integrator to go ahead and start integrating. And then they do that for a precise amount of time. And then they switch over to your reference. And then what happens is they start a counter counting. As soon as a switch occurs, they, call, they start a counter counting. And then what happens is your input is going to cause this slope to vary depending on the input. So the bigger the input is, the larger the slope, and your counter will count more. The lower, the, the smaller it is, the, the smaller the slope, and your counter will count less. So if you ever look at multimeters, this is, you know a multimeter uses an integrator as this is A to D converter because they're rated in counts. We can buy 2,000 count meters, we can buy what? 4,000 count meters, and we can buy 6,000 count meters. So automatically, every time, it's got a reference voltage in there. Got a reference voltage. And that's why it takes, these guys are not fast. So that's why, did, that's one of the biggest advantages of a digital multimeter is that they're not real fast. Right? You understand that? How long, I mean, you can miss things on a digital multimeter. Cause they, they, and that's the problem with most A to D converters is that if I was to come up here and I was to put a, a number up here and I say, convert that to binary, I put a decimal number up here and con I say convert that to binary, uh, how many could do that in their head? So digital analog conversion takes time. And that's what they call, they call it the sample rate. How, how fast can the digital analog converter take an analog input and convert it over to a lot? Yeah. So these guys are pretty neat. They'll switch, they'll, they'll, uh, They'll switch your analog input and they'll charge a capacitor. So that way, if the, if the input changes while you're trying to convert it, you know, if you're, if it changes when you're trying to convert it, you got problems, right? You know what I'm saying? You'll never get a conversion factor. Your slopes would be all over the place. So what they do is they take, they, they take the input and they, they switch it over a capacitor for a certain amount of time and then they take the analog off that capacitor and they do it, they do it faster than the capacitor can discharge. But it's going to take a lot of time, and it's going to generate the slope, and then it starts a counter counting, and depending on what, the, the reference voltage, what that capacitor is charged up to, depends on how many counts you get before it stops. And as soon as it crosses zero, that's when it displays. It displays whatever's on your counter up to your display on the meter. And then what does it do? Switches back over to the reference voltage. Right, you understand. Integrates this way, switches up to your voltage, charges the capacitor, switches off, then it lets, then it starts counting until it crosses zero again. And so as your meter is constantly doing what? You ever watched them? You ever took a pod and turned it real fast and watched it wait waited for your meter to catch up with your pod? So these are used in meters. Now what a PLC uses, I don't know. Uh, these guys are extremely accurate. Uh, 
there, the resolution is determined by the number of counts available. And that's what it is. So a 2,000 2, count meter is going to range on what? It's going to range on this. A 4,000 count meter, is a, if it's a four digit, a four and a half digit meter, it's going to range on that. A 6,000 count meter will range on what? I'm sorry, 5.9. 6,000 count meters are pretty expensive. 4,000 count meters are more expensive than 2,000 count meters. 2,000 count meters, are better. but you can tell the number of counts by where it ranges at, right? You know what I'm saying? So if yours ranges on fours, then you got, if it goes to the next range, every time it counts up to four, then you got a 4,000 count meter. If it ranges on twos, every time it tries to count to two in the most significant digit, then you got a 2,000 count meter. If it ranges on fives, when it tries to count to sit, you got a 6,000 count meter. So the meters use integrated. I know that for a fact. All the scales that I worked on, all the digital scales, all the digital scales I worked on use this guy. So it would surprise me at the PLC. They're very accurate. The only problem is, is that uh, they're, they're slow compared to the flash converter. The flash converter, your flash is what? You're, you're, you get an inst almost instant output of your A to D converter uh, with a change in input. Uh, the problem with those is that those resistors are going to have to be, like I said, if it's eight bits, right? You understand? You're going to only get eight levels of it. Okay, guys, got any questions here so far? So those are the three types. But like I said, touch is what? And it's transparent. Uh, meters, it's not. Digital meters, it's not. Because that's what they're telling you. They're telling you that it's using an integrator. That's all we're gonna do since I made y'all skip y'all's other break. We'll get out for 10 minutes early. Right. So any questions so far? There's a lot to say. So what we got to do is understand our sensor is gonna give us an output. And then we're gonna have to make that output mean something, right? I gotta understand that. You know, we live in an analog world, guys. So a lot of our sensors are analog. So if I need, in my industry, we're constantly sensing pressures, we're sensing temperatures, we're sensing all different types of things. And then we got, but odds are our, odds are our computers are what? That when they're not, if it, if it runs a PLC, then that PLC is digital. And so like I said, either if it's a, if it's a modular PLC, uh, you'll probably have to buy an analog input. If it's a fixed PLC, just about all your fixed PLCs now have analog inputs on. Uh, the 1200s that we bought, uh, they have a little section in the center. I'll have to show you that. It's called a signal card. That uh, you can make it part of the PLC. You don't have to put a module on it. And we bought analog outputs for those. So the 1200s, the uh, Siemens 1200s, the S7 1200s we have have analog inputs and analog outputs. Uh, the 1100s that we have, all they've got, the Allen Bradley's, all they, all they have is analog inputs. They have two analog inputs. So, see y'all Thursday. What's to do by Thursday? So, Syllabus so agreement, right? What's to do by Thursday? The syllabus agreement. The syllabus, is, the syllabus agreement, is, uh, the uh, assignment one is due by midnight Friday, right? Since we only had one class and there was so much confusion going around uh, the, first, the first time, that uh, we went ahead and extended. Uh, go back somewhere and read that binary system. I think it's going to be next Saturday. Probably not. All we're going to do is understand when that. But you know, in the engineer, we're going to report we had resistors and converters and stuff like that. Well, in intro to PLC, you were supposed to go through basics too. I had that video. Oh, okay. I thought you had.
there's all kind of presentations and stuff on on, on binary and decimal. You, you can go and shows you how to convert them. Uh, just research them, converting from binary decimal to binary and like that. I've done it a long time ago. Well, that would be the best place to get the review. It's just go just go online and just look up converting binary to decimal and decimal to binary. Our big thing is going from from decimal to binary. Okay. Because we're dealing with sensors here. We're not dealing with outputs. If we if we was going to outputs, we'd have to go from binary. We'd have to go from binary to decimal. But inputs inputs we'll have we need to understand decimal. Have a basic understanding of. Uh, we're going from binary to decimal. Part, really. No. Then, well, no. One, you do subtraction to do it one way. You do addition to do it other. So it's it's not hard. You know. I go back. But what we do if I was going from binary to decimal is I just come over and I'd say one, two, four, eight, sixteen. I'd add sixteen plus four plus one, and I'm through. That's binary to decimal. If I was going to go from decimal to binary, I would start off my number like 38, and then I'd start, I'd start subtracting power to two. I would find the biggest one I could subtract. But you could go, you can go, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just go find that and I'll read The best thing to do in this class is to get, if you're cal most calculators do. Yeah. I don't know if that one will or not. I know your Windows calculator does. You probably got a calculator on your. So in this class, what I would do is I would come over here. Now notice this is this is Windows Seven, and then I'll just go to Programmer's Calculator, and then I would come up here and I would say whatever number I wanted to do. I would say thirty-eight, and then I'd come over here and go to binary. Oh, Eric, I got a but look, even on your even on your tablet, uh, your little tablet you have, uh, it's probably got a calculator on. it. If it don't have a calculator on it, you can you can download an application. I guarantee you that will do. My phone, uh, well, uh, the calculator uh, application on my phone, I think does that. Okay. I think they're in my best drawer. Well, you might be able to download that on your phone. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, it. I guarantee you there's a there's an app you can get uh, that's uh, that's got uh, that will do conversions for you. I need to contact Miss Wilson. So this is this calculator is kind of, the calculator for the iPhone is kind of misleading until you turn it like this. <laughs> I got a call. Huh? That concepts class. Any research or something I need to start doing? I, that's a, that's a perfectly legal question, and <laughs> the answer I got, I have absolutely no idea. Hey, uh, I've never taught the class. I've never sat in the class. Uh, uh, Nancy's supposed to be putting the website together. Okay. I was talking to Eric. You know what I told you earlier about the book of sets? If you can attach two of those things. Can I you sub, subtly check that? He's going to need a job, and I'm saying, Eric, you can pass two of those. I don't know. That's, it's, it's highly unlikely 